Hey guys, as, as men, we tend to define ourselves based on our image or our brand, the things that we accomplish, the uh, stuff we accumulate. Those are unreachable, and at the end of the day, they're actually exercises in futility. This week, we interview ex-Net NFL quarterback Jeff Kemp about why branding yourself and building an image that others see that is not the identity that Christ has given you is a futile attempt at becoming your best version. You, this week, you will take away a plan to recognize this false branding, which is so prevalent today. You will find affirmation in God as his son and be encouraged to find a brotherhood of men who will call you up to your best version. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 27, Paul says, I discipline my body and make it my slave. You know, we often forget, guys, that God has called us to steward the bodies he gave us so that we'll be ready, healthy, and spiritually dangerous to fight the good fight, whether it's working at your job, serving your God, protecting your bride, or being a great dad to your kids. That's why we're so excited to partner with Mountain Tough Fitness Lab. Mountain Tough Fitness Lab is run by Christian men who are passionate about training you to be your best version and to stay dangerous and ready for God. Join me on my journey by going to mountaintough.com and getting your free six-week trial when you type in the code ARENA30. You won't be disappointed. Stay dangerous. Hey guys, thanks again for making this podcast Spotify's number one podcast for Christian men. Guys, last year, our podcast subscribers tripled thanks to you sharing and uh, sharing these links with your buddies and subscribing yourself. So thank you guys for making this uh, what it is today. We sure appreciate locking arms with all of our people. And today, guys, you're going to love our interview. We've got my friend Jeff Kemp here. He lives in Little Rock, Arkansas with his beautiful wife of 40 years, Stacy. Jeff's a former NFL quarterback who retired after 11 years in the NFL to focus his passion on helping families, especially men. He led Stronger Families, an organization dedicated to helping families thrive. He later served as the vice president at Family Life, which is a leading ministry that supports marriages, family, and churches. Jeff is a nationally sought-after speaker and author of two books, Facing the Blitz, Three Strategies for Turning Trials into Triumphs, which that is episode number 314 if you want to check it out on the Men in the Arena podcast. He's also the author of his brand new book. That's If you're on YouTube right now, guys, it's over his right-hand shoulder there, Receive the Way of Jesus and Men, which is our focus today. Jeff, it's great having the show, man. Hey, Jim, it's great to be with you and all the guys. Thanks. Yeah, we sure appreciate you and your heart for men and all that you do. Hey, why don't you do me a favor here? Uh, I've read both your books cover to cover. Tell us a little bit. I mean, I whenever guys hear NFL, they see the footballs behind you. They go, oh, tell us a little bit about your background, a little bit more about your uh, life story so our guys can get some context. Cool. Well, uh, I'm praying like you that whatever I say is what agrees with God, points to Jesus, and agrees with the Bible and is helping helpful to dudes. And I really pray that guys would hear whatever God wants to say to them, you know, um, not, not you and, and not me, uh, but him, my background, uh, grew up in a family with dad playing pro football. And so I just thought, Hey, that's a good job. I'll be a quarterback. Like my dad was, he was quarterback of the bills in the sixties when I was a little boy. Um, he then went to Congress. So I was used to a big, high performing, visible life. And my vision for um, being somebody was, man, I got to be significant. You know, I got to be successful. My dad was super encouraging, totally affectionate. I was a late bloomer, but he still said, hey, your day's going to come. I believe in you. You know, you look good. Dad, I didn't even get in the game. And he said, oh, I know. I saw you warming up. You're really throwing well. He was he was that kind of dad, uh, the, the all-time encourager. And that really helped me persevere through being kind of a you know medium good but not star quarterback, um, we grew up uh, in Buffalo and then in Maryland, and I went to college at Dartmouth, and uh, finally got to play my last two years and was good, but I wasn't great. I snuck into the NFL as a free agent. Uh, never really would have made it without all that encouragement from my dad. You know, I've become a persevering. Uh, late blooming uh, quarterback. And then my career was way more backup oriented. I had about three years of starting and uh, eight of backing up. Um, I met my wife in California the first year with the Rams. 
And it was right as I was kind of saying, okay, God, enough of this calling myself a Christian, but living totally opposite it. Um, and, you know, finally getting the success I wanted and the popularity um, and trying out some of the sin. I thought it'd be so fun. And, you know, I did have some fun, but it, it was a short half-life and I was empty. Um, and I wondered, geez, why if I'm having everything I want and I'm finally successful and going to the NFL, um, am I so empty? And so Romans 8, 28 spoke to me and, you know, kind of said, uh, hey, you're called for, for your purpose, not God's purpose. And things work together for good for those that love God and his purpose. So that was the beginning of my serious Christian journey. And uh, the Rams had a bunch of Christian buddies, uh, then the Seahawks and, and 49ers and Eagles. And I, I just got I got discipled. I got dis I got mentored. I got strengthened in my 11 years in the NFL by my uh, my brothers and by my wife. Uh, we have four kids. Um, like I mentioned, we played for four teams and I knew that I'd probably do something to strengthen families and build God's kingdom afterwards. So that's what I did. I started running a nonprofit to strengthen fatherhood and marriage in Seattle. And then we kind of went more national and I worked at family life, which is what brought me to, um, Little Rock. They do a lot of big marriage weekend. Oh yeah. Members. Oh yeah. We speak for those. Uh, but I've been off on my own doing uh, what I call men huddle, building the identity of leaders and men uh, in Christ to be living as sons and then championing friendship because it's a giant deficit in America. Men need friends. Men need a team. And that's what we're here to talk about. Yeah. So so would you so your book, Receive, which is again over your right hand shoulder there, The Way of Jesus for Men. So why the title and what is the book about? Well, the title uh, is cool because uh, it changed. I feel like oh. God gave it to me. I feel like I received it. Um, I've been speaking to men for many years, but I didn't have a, a, a book or a message that was smack dab in the middle of the speaking to men's hearts. Uh. The Blitz book is great for that because we all face trouble, but it wasn't comprehensive. What is a man? How do I measure up? You know, how, how do I uh, live this life? How do I follow Jesus? Um, and I wanted to write a book like that for men. I was going to call it Real Good Man, like authentic and benevolent, right? Um, and model it after Jesus. Um, and the story is that I started back in 2019 or so, but in 2020, all of my speaking, which is men's retreats and men's conferences um, and, a, and a few other teamwork and business talks, uh, all of it shut down in, in a matter of a week. And my wife said, this is good news. You can stay home and um, I won't be so lonely because you got too busy speaking and we can start playing tennis again. And you should write that book you said you're going to write that you've been putting off. So I did that. But interestingly, I asked God to refather me. And in March of 2020, with the example of Ed McGlasson uh, of Blessing of the Father Ministry and the Father Difference down in Newport Beach, uh, who had at age 40, asked God to refather him. He was a pastor, a former football player, and he realized he was doing Christianity in the same, you know, command and control performance mentality. And he was succeeding as a pastor, a uh, big church, you know, popular speaker, but it wasn't working in marriage or in raising his daughters, and he was losing their hearts. So I, I asked God to refather me, and I'll speed the story up, Jim, but. Um, in reading about Jesus, the Bible came alive because I was reading it as a son listening to my father instead of as a Christian trying to learn something and write a book. And what I discovered about Jesus as my journal filled up every day was he lived completely in humility and dependence on his father as a son. And everything came out of his sonship of the father. And if Jesus who was perfect and powerful and courageous and studly and amazing, needed to depend on the Father and said, I cannot do anything apart from my Father, and I don't want to do anything. I only do what he says to do. If he's like that, Jeff should be like that, and Jim should be like that. And we Christian guys that are struggling, we could be let off the hook of performance Christianity and performance manhood, and we can receive it from the Father through the relationship with Jesus. 
So that changed the title to receive, because that's the way to be a man, not what is a man. Jesus is the model of what is a man. But the key is, we can't perform, we need to receive it. So that's how the title changed to receive the way of Jesus for men. I like it. So go. can you redefine here the word refathering? I'd never heard that phrase until I read your book. What does that mean when you say that yeah. phrase, that word? Well, hey, there's some of us guys that have a really encouraging and positive dads, um, but they're not perfect. Yeah. And there's some things we've picked up along the way that need to be replaced by being fathered by Abba Father, Jesus's father, our perfect father who adopted us because Jesus died on the cross. And if we receive that forgiveness, we're adopted. And it's a whole new relationship. He wants us to have the same relationship with the father that he had. Some of us had kind of mediocre dads, a little passive, maybe not there. Uh, maybe a divorce separated, you know, your mom and dad, and you didn't see him as much as you wanted. Or maybe your dad was just negative. Never said, I love you. Never said, I'm proud of you. Just never said, I, you have what it takes. You know, tore you down, called you a doofus, whatever. Um, every one of us need to be refathered, regardless of the dad you have. And refathered means start a new chapter where you ask God to tell you who he is as a father, and start reading the Bible that way, and who you are as his son. And it's it's very tied into the idea John Trent has talked about of the blessing, right? Receiving the Father's blessing, like Jesus received it when he got baptized and on the Mount of Transfiguration. Um, this is my son, identity, my beloved son, unconditionally loved, who I delight in and take pleasure in, approval, you know? You want dad to clap for you, put his arm on you and say, way to go. Uh, and then he said on the Transfiguration, He's the chosen one. Listen to him. And right there, God gave Jesus his place, his purpose. Well, we need to get all those things from Father God. And refathering is basically just asking him, who are you as a father? Who am I as your son? How do you want us to relate together? And what do you want me to know? What do you want me to get rid of that's a lie? Um, how do I really accept and receive my true identity? And start fathering me, God, answering questions. So I ask questions in my journal with a big box, leaving it open, saying, hey, Lord, hey, Father, hey, Abba, what do you want to say to me today? What about my marriage? What about this mission at Men Huddle? Am I too ambitious? Um, am I not focused enough? Do you want me doing this or don't you? Mm -hmm. um, is this book on track or, or isn't it? You know, what's important? Mm -hmm. Show me. You know, uh, am I more prideful than I think? You Ask know, God questions, yeah. and he starts fathering you. Well, you know, it's interesting, Jeff. So based on your definition, I had an experience like that in 2017. Uh, you called it refathering. I, For me, it was all about performance and affirmation of that performance by others. And in 2017, I had an experience with God where I realized he is my validation, he is my affirmation. And once I did that and, and began to receive that and walk in that, everything exploded from there. And the beautiful thing about it is, as our ministry's grown, I could really care less about the fame of it all or the popularity of all. All that matters is that he's put on display, not me. And I think that wouldn't have happened before 17. So I really appreciate that. When I when I read your book, uh, one quote stood out early on as maybe the theme of the book. So I'm going to ask you about this quote, because it seems to me that this book is really about receiving God's identity for you. You said this yes. You said this in the introduction. You said, you don't have to earn your identity or prove your manhood. Your identity is received, not achieved. Do you want to add anything to that? I agree with it. Who wrote that, Jim? I don't know, but it's good, and it's all it's written down, and probably will be referred to again. So, <laughs> so I've been I've been saying to men, you can't achieve your identity or your manhood, and that's good news. Yeah, for sure. The good news is, if you think you can earn your identity, if you think you can achieve your, I'm a good man. I've measured up. I got what it takes. I'm impressive. You know, I stack up in the Twitter sphere uh, in or the X sphere or whatever they call it now, or in the marketplace or on the sports field or with women or in style and fashion and money and possessions and lifestyle and vacation and adventure in strength, body lifting. If you think you're trying to measure up and perform your manhood, it's a never ending treadmill. 
you'll never get to the top of that mountain. You'll fail way more than you ever expected. And you'll have an insecurity that can only be answered by receiving your identity through the adoption into Father God's family, through putting your faith and trust in Jesus. It's like if salvation is received by grace and forgiveness by grace, well, so is identity received by grace. And, and so is manhood. And the manhood will receive won't be the concoction the culture comes up with for you. It won't be, you know, some Christian book that you're trying to live up to to do it exactly like this. The model is Jesus, and he wants you to live it out in dependence on the Father who will give you the guidance minute to minute, day to day, hour to hour, like the Father did. So it's the quality of your relationship to receive that's going to determine how secure are you in your identity as his son? And what kind of man are you? Are you living well for others? You know, are you are you strong, but for their benefit, mm. which is what Jesus was? Well, you know, it's really interesting because one of the things we tell guys at Men in the Arena is we have this thing we call man theology. It's pretty simple. You can never become the best version of the man that God created you to be without radical devotion to the God who made you and following him. You know, that you know, as guys find their identities out here, that's not where they find their identity. It's a horizontal. They've got a or a vertical identity. Find it in Jesus. He will mold you into the man he wants you to be. And that, you know, but we have to go radically all in for him. And this is what you're saying in your book. You know, what you you wrote this. You said a uh, contrary to cultural messaging, toxic masculinity is not to blame, which apparently you do too. A uh, true masculinity responsibility and strength inclined to help and protect others is good. So what? how would you define ma true masculinity? Jesus. <laughs> I, okay, I, I agree. He is the alpha and the omega, right? Well, no, not only is he fully God, but he was fully human. Yeah. And he had to be a baby. He had to be a boy. He had to go to the synagogue to, to listen to the rabbis uh, and to learn and to interact with them. He had to learn to do carpentry. He had to learn to be honest. He had to avoid sexual temptation. Uh, he, he had to, you know, uh, buffet his body so he was ready. Um, he had to build friendships, and he built them better than any of us ever have in history. And he called these 12 dudes his friends, and then he turned them into friends. And they were a pretty rough and raw crowd. Yep, yep, yep. But 12 friends changed the world. So right there, I'm saying that Jesus was fully human, but he was also a team player. He didn't do this thing alone. And we men don't just receive our identity and then go off to be some good Christian man, dude, uh, good husband, good dad. No, you do it in brotherhood, man. You do it. In, my friend Ed, um, I told you about about him and the way he touched me and said, "Why don't you try being refathered like I did?" That was a team connection that Ed planted a seed that changed my life. I got another buddy, Marvin uh, Charles, who. Uh, grew up with drugs, prostitution, was living on the wrong side of the tracks. He said he was uh, a lieutenant in Satan's army and, and living for the flesh and the dollar. Um, but he met Jesus Christ when he hit the end of his road. He started mentoring men, and he's mentored 4,000 men out of not being connected to their kids and getting into being fathers. He's got a ministry called Dads. Well, when he was like 44 years old, uh, Two white business guys came to this inner city black dude, very successful. Marvin's amazing. He's intelligent, but his whole career has been serving others. And uh, they came to him, and one of them reached up to big, tall Marvin and put his hands on his shoulders and said, Marvin, you're a good man. Mm. The Father blesses you, and I bless you. Marvin kind of started to cry and shake a little bit. He said, what are you doing? What are you doing? He says, I'm blessing you and I'm naming you as the father would and the father did Jesus. I, I, I sense you've never been named and blessed. And Marvin said, I haven't. And I needed that. And I love it. He said, just a minute. And he ran to the other room and he got his 12 year old and his 14 year old and he brought him in and he said, let's do that for them. And immediately he prayed that blessing over them. Do you see the teamwork of manhood? And do you see the, the connection of the, of the blessing being a way that a man like Marvin receives his identity as a beloved son of the father. 
You know, it's and it, then he gave it to his sons. There's an action item there, huh? I mean, isn't there, there is. an action? I mean, I even and you can take it a step further. About six years ago, I wrote a blessing letter to my dad. You know, just saying what a great dad he was, and it, it just changed everything for us. You know, just giving him the blessing because as fathers, you know, we were always questioning our fatherhood, our fathering. You know, did we do good? Where did we mess up? But I think you're saying something really powerful there, Jeff. I think as men listening to this. You men, listen to this. You need to find an older man to bless you, to to pray a blessing over you. If you did not receive that from your father, you need to do that. And then you absolutely have to follow Matthew 17, and you have to bless your children. You have to bless your children. I mean, I would just say, man, just go home and do that. <laughs> yeah, well, let's make it simple for guys. Um, you can look at Matthew 3 and Matthew 17, where Jesus is blessed and named um, by the Father, okay? He's being fathered by the Heavenly Father. Mm -hmm. He's receiving um, his identity and his security and his unconditional approval and love and his mission, all right? Um, Gideon received it when he was hiding and wasn't acting like some stud captain leader general. Uh, that's when the angel of the Lord, Jesus, showed up and says, Gideon, you're a great and mighty man of valor, a studly warrior. And Gideon was like, I'm the smallest in my little family, and we're the littlest family of everyone in Israel. No, what matters is what God says about you. Well, read those passages and then pray and say, God, who is a man that understands this and has that peace of God uh, that walks with God? And then ask him to bless you. And then you get to bless your dad like mm -hmm. you did. And mm -hmm. I did to my dad one time too. I was asking my dad on these rites of passage weekends with my 18 year old sons to bless and pray over my sons. Uh, and I realized no one had blessed dad. So I put my hands on my dad's shoulders with these other men, my peers, a couple of football players, uh, a mentor of mine and my son. And we prayed a blessing on my dad. Wow. You're God's beloved son in whom he's well pleased and takes delight and you have a mission and a purpose as an ambassador for God. Thank you for the ambassador for God you've been, Dad. Wow. Uh, wow. That touched him. And then I could ask my dad to bless me, which I did. He got cancer. He was 73. He was about two days from, from dying. He was about 60 pounds down, no hair, just laying on the bed. And I kept visiting each month from Seattle back to D.C. And I said, Dad, would you pray a blessing? over me. And he knows that the Bible, he knows the Jewish tradition of the bar mitzvah and the father blessing the son at age 13. And so my dad put his hand on my shoulder, or actually it was on my arm. We're both laying on the bed. And he said, dear God, and his voice was raspy like mine, but really pretty weak, right? With cancer. And he said, help Jeff to remember his talent. Help him to remember the force for good he is in this mm. world and help us both remember the only thing that matters is thy will be done. Amen. Those were the last words other than I love you on the phone that I heard from my dad. They were an amazingly succinct Gettysburg address type lesson. Yeah, for sure. He affirmed my strength and my gifts given to me by God, which he knew I understood that. And my purpose to be a force for good in the world. Yeah, right? Your, yeah. your identity is tied up to my mission for God as an ambassador for Christ. And then he took all the pressure of performance off me. He said, but the only thing that matters is thy will be done. How powerful. So yes, you can go do, do this for your dad. And you can do this for your son or grandson, uh, granddaughter or your daughter. Um, you can do it for a friend like that business guy did for Marvin. Um, and you can go and ask a pastor, a mentor, a good friend, even a group of men, hey, would you guys pray a blessing over me? I need to start living like the son of God that I am. It's really interesting, Jeff, whenever I have a guy on the show, especially the authors, I try to figure out, okay, what, what are we, where are we going with this thing? And with your book, I was like, man, I really felt that this is a book about your, your battle, a man's battle between his identity and his image. There's, there's Those two seem to be tenuous to me. There's a tension between my image and my identity. You wrote in your book on page 10, you said identity is who we are deep down inside, but image 
is the way we sell ourselves to others. So can you talk to us about this tension? I mean, I think this might be the one of the greatest tensions of men is we identify with our work, with our accolades, with our achievements. Uh, there's a tension there. Can you walk us through yeah. this whole image identity tension? Um, let's go back to 10th grade Jeff Kemp. <laughs> this cute girl, Nadine, was walking on her way to our high school every day from my neighborhood. Hey, I'm laughing. Up. I'm laughing, Jeff, because I read the story. <laughs> yeah, I'd walk, I'd walk like 50 <laughs> feet behind her saying, oh, I, I'd like to catch up with her. I'd like to talk to her. I'd like to know her. I'd, I'd like to hold her hand someday. Gosh, you know, I, I'd like to make out with her. I'd like her to be my girlfriend. Um, but at the moment, I would just like to catch up with her and walk next to her, which I didn't have the guts to do. My my identity was wrapped up in my image that I am too insecure because I'm not yet a starting quarterback. I'm short for my age. I'm kind of new to this school. Um, I'm not Mr. Cool with the girls. And so with that lack of confidence, I'm not able to build a relationship with her or even walk next to her. In college, now I'm a success. I've started for two years. Um, you know, my acne clears up. I'm getting good grades in an Ivy League school. Uh, I got a contract uh, coming to play in the NFL. Um, and I'm popular in my fraternity and everything. It's all turned around. But if we lost a game, Jim, I was so insecure that my identity was actually my image of this successful, popular guy. Yeah. And I wouldn't go straight to the party. I'd go have to have a couple beers in the basement of our fraternity to get my courage up to show up after we were losing. And even then I was self-conscious. What are they thinking of me? That's image-based, performance-based and identity. It's it's out exterior and it can go away. Man, I got cut from the Seahawks middle of the season as a starting quarterback. One day they were all asking for my autographs and writing articles about me. The next day I wasn't even on the team. Did I lose my identity? At that point, no. Because by then at age 27, I had figured out my identity is based in my relationship with God. It's relationship-based. It's vertically-based. It's not performance, horizontal-based, or what the audience thinks of me. Am I cool? Do I fit in? You know, how many followers do I have? Uh, shoot, Andre Agassi, he had the best image going, and he even said image is everything. He lost a tennis match one time because his blonde flowing wig that he started wearing after his hair started coming out wig. to match the image he'd built got messed up during the shower in the morning and he was afraid it was going to come off. And he was so distracted by this problem with his hairpiece that he couldn't focus on being the best tennis player in the world, which he was. And he lost the match. What a great example of you're going to, you're going to blow it and be an idiot in your marriage. You're going to blow it and be an idiot in your fatherhood. You're going to blow it and be an idiot at work. And you won't build true friendships that'll be there in the day you need them. If you're sticking to everything on the surface and you're afraid to admit, hey, I got some problems, I got some issues, uh, but here's the real me. Uh, it's not, you know, Joe Salesman. It's not, you know, superstar athlete. It's not guy that drives a Porsche 911. Um, I'm a son of God who's on his journey trying to fin some figure some things out, but I know I'm loved by him so I can afford to be real with you. Well, you know, hey. I know I'm loved. I know I'm loved by God because of what Jesus did, mm -hmm. not because of how good I am. Yep. So much that I am comfortable being real with other men. And that's what allows you to make friendship. And frankly, if you're not real with your wife, your relationship won't be intimate. And if it won't be intimate, it will not be trusting and strong and safe. And if it's not those things, your sex life is going to shrink. Porn and other women will become more attractive and you won't be married for a long time. And then your kids are going to go through a lot of identity insecurity because mom and dad split up and they're not sure if they're loved. You know, a couple of things stand out to me, Jeff, in what you're saying. The, the first thing is that, and you wrote this on page 14 of your book, that, that image is absolutely unreliable. It's just unreliable. Nobody's per You wrote in your book, nobody's perfect and therefore every image we concoct is compromised from the start. So I, I just want to say this, guys, you guys drive in right now, listen to this podcast. Hear Jeff right now. The images that you put up are unreliable. And if they're in anything but Jesus, they are a counterfeit. So the other thing, Jeff, that you said that really inner that just you said it in passing. It's not in your book. You said 
when you got cut, I was 27, but I handled it because I had my identity in Christ. That's a really huge statement because we've got a lot of guys listening to this podcast in their 20s, and it is the earlier... I want you to talk to this. Talk to the young guys. Our audience is basically 45, 50 years old to probably 30. These younger guys, the sooner they figure out their identity, the better things will be in their life. How does a guy figure this out? Like, How does he move from identifying in his accolades or his career or his finances? How does a guy transition from image-based to identity and Christ-based? That's a great question. First, you got to be convinced that the performance and image and brand approach is not going to work. That's good. And yeah. We're making a pretty good case for it right now, but look around at movie stars, musicians, tons of them died at age 27 because their success and their fame and their popularity and the, the, the um, high amount of sex and, and fun that they were having wasn't satisfying, you know? And how about rich dudes who just do stupid stuff to get more money? Um, you know, real estate developers that always have to do another bigger deal that ends up finally breaking them. Uh, no one is satisfied. No one is secure. Hollywood people are more insecure than in, than anyone. Uh, some counselors said they are the least secure because they don't know if people love them for the real them or the package, the bandwagon. So first of all, just realize that brand, image, the accoutrements of success and possessions and wealth and popularity, they will not get it done. They do nothing for relationships but make you arrogant and proud, which, which is what screws up and divides relationships. So, okay, let's turn the corner. There's a God that made you, and the world is running away from him, and they mislabel him, they counterfeit him, they make up false definitions of him. They paint the picture as him as the problem, stodgy, boring. Uh, absolutely, totally, 100% wrong. Absolutely false. Correct. I agree 100%. You're going to live in a, if you, if you let your relationship with the creator be reconnected through Jesus Christ, because we're all disconnected. We, we're born into a messed up world with messed up hearts, whole bunch of pride, whole bunch of selfishness, whole bunch of insecurity. Um, and, and, any bit of it, even Mother Teresa's little bit of sin would have separated her from God. It was only Jesus and grace that gets... If you, if you get reconnected to God, you're going to live not for 90 years, but for infinite eternity. And it's not going to be clouds and harps and singing hymns with some grandmas from the 1800s. Heaven is called paradise. It's a new earth with everything that's presently made even better. But no tears, no bitterness, no grief, no dying, no sickness. Uh, and heaven is going to be recreated. So if God is that amazingly good, stop looking at the little teeny picture, thinking I need to get a little bit of cotton candy and a couple of trinkets to make me happy, and say, God, who are you really? What kind of father are you really? Explore the Bible. Read the story in, in Luke 15 about the dude that said, give me the money, dad. I want to go have a blast. And he did. It didn't turn out well. He went broke. Uh, he may have, may have had a, a, a venereal disease or something. <laughs> uh, he, he couldn't eat anything. That's an interesting take on that. I never thought that one through. <laughs> he, he comes, he, 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 this is the prodigal son story. Yeah. Oh, I know. <laughs> and, and there was another older brother. They were both sons who had a perfect father, loving, gracious, sharing his wealth with them, living on the estate. But the, the older son stayed there and performed to try to achieve his perfect son status. The younger son said, screw it, I'm out of here. I want to do it my way. He did, but he finally humbled himself and came back. And the father jumped off the porch. He'd been looking for him, but he hadn't chased him down into the alleys. He hadn't followed him into the bar. He wasn't in the, in the pigsty, you know, uh, saying, oh, come on, come on, come on, come on. I'm begging you to come home. Uh, God's gracious. He doesn't twist our arm. But that father is the picture Jesus painted of what Abba Father God is like, the creator of the universe, who sacrificed his son Jesus for us. 
And he says, you're back? Here's a robe. Here's a ring. Here's some sandals. Let's kill that fatted calf. Let's get a barbecue going. Let's have a party. You're back. You were dead. Now you're alive. An older brother, dude, please come on in. No way. He doesn't deserve it. This isn't fair. This isn't right. That guy's all angry. But the father said, everything I've always had has been yours too. That is the picture of the father. So young men, go on a search for the true father of God and look at the true man, Jesus, and what he did. Okay. And then find some men who have this faith and say, dudes, can you show me what Father God is like and what being a son is all about uh, and how I can start um, figuring out that my identity is relationship based? Number one, God doesn't make junk and he made me, so I'm worth a bunch. So much he sent Jesus to die. Number two, yeah, I'm jacked up. I'm I'm messed up. I've gone to church, but I kind of am pretending I got a bunch of hypocrisy or I don't go to church. Who cares? Um I, I care because church, imperfect as it is, is the place to grow with the Christians. But the point is, that's not what gets you to God. Uh, at that point, you say, wow, I'm so jacked up that Jesus died for me and says, I'm going to credit you with my righteousness, even though you're not living that way yet. So God can smile on you and adopt you and put his arm on you and say, son, I'm so proud of you. I take delight in you. That is where you will start to get your identity and it can set you free from your social media accounts, comparison, and all the other games we play. Uh, and you know, they used to say men tried to build their identity on three Bs, ball field, sports, bedroom, women, and billfold, you know, money, wealth, achievement, business. Uh, there's a fourth one now, it's called brand. Everyone's got to have their brand. And it changes every day because there's a million new ways to be a man. Skinny jeans, fat jeans, short jeans, long jeans, these shoes, those shoes, this beard, that beard, this hair, that hair, no hair, you know, this truck, this car, this style. Uh, it's just so confusing. Who do you please? You don't need to please anyone. Jesus accomplished it. You're the father's son. He affirms you. He just wants you to receive that identity. And then, yeah, go ahead and look at Jesus because he'll give you the blueprints for manhood. Courageous, true, consistent, totally into friendship, totally a team member, honest as can be, and treated women with total dignity and respect that was shocking in that era. Oh, shocking. Yes. Well, you know, it's interesting, Jeff, in, in sharing what you shared, I want to highlight a couple of things you said. The first thing is I wholeheartedly affirm that it's not about Jesus plus the church. It's about Jesus, period. If you have Jesus, period, you're going to find the church and other things that are necessary, but it's you, we've got to go to Jesus, period. And the other thing I want to say is this. you know, that let, me, let, me, but let me footnote that, Jim. You got it. What you're saying is go to Jesus to be transformed and have an experience with God. Yes. Don't go to the church to be a consumer who's trying to get some benefits from God. Because you'll always say, oh, that church has too many hypocrites. The pastor talks too long. I don't like the music. They're asking me for money too much. Guess why? They're humans. They're imperfect like you. But if you receive everything that Jesus has done for you in this adoption, and it's a vertical relationship with God 100%, then a church, a Bible study, a small group, um, all of a sudden it becomes a team tool for God to keep growing you and you to help grow others and then to go out and reach the poor and the lost and the least of these, which is what the church has done historically better than any other yep. vehicle on earth. And it's the most diverse people group on the planet. And you, yeah, yep. you want diversity? There it is. So it's interesting. Uh, I love what you're saying because yeah, we're, we're saying to find your identity in your, in Christ and not your brand or your image you know, but we're not saying don't do anything. I mean, you had said on page 177, you wrote, being an investor instead of a consumer means replacing blaming and complaining with humility and encouragement. So there is stuff, you know, God has a job for us to do. You know, you talked about Luke 15. There's something very profound in Luke 15, and you mentioned it. The, the father put a ring on his son, which is a symbol of uh, power of attorney. He put a, a robe over him, which is a, a mantle, a mantle. But the thing that was powerful to me was that he put sandals on his feet. The son came without shoes. 
in that day and age, this father was probably pretty wealthy, right? In that day and age, only the slaves were shoeless. So the kid came as a slave and he, the father put shoes on him and said, no, you're a son. In other words, there's nothing that you can do. Your identity is in as my son, no matter what you do, I will never remove that identity from you. And that is so profound when we're trying to build our brand and that brand is just not going to get us there. It's empty. It's empty. I'm I'm ever I'm going to speak to every guy out there who believes in Jesus and trusts him cuz you can't just say I believe in him in your head. You got to say he's he's such a big deal. He made such serious claims. I'm this I'm the I'm the way the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. Um you got you got to respond to what he says. But if you believe in him, if you trust him, if you're if you're aiming to follow him or if you're about to cuz you're starting to realize yeah, I've given a lip service and it's up in my head, but it isn't in my heart. Um, then this is what becomes true of you. It's written down in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. It says, God, this Father God, Abba Father God, made Jesus, the one who never ever sinned, to be sin's punishment for us who do sin, which is basically do it your own way instead of God's way. God made Jesus to be sin's punishment for us so that we who receive him could become the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Basically, he's saying, I'm giving you the mantle, the sandals, the ring, and the credit for the perfect righteous life Jesus lived. And I'm adopting you as my son, and I make you heir to everything I have. And I smile on you, even though you're still kind of rascally and messing up. You got an anger problem. You're drinking too much. That marijuana thing is what you go to instead of God. Um, you know, your compromise with porn or with women um, is pretty significant. Guess what? I do not see you in one moment in time and space. I'm outside of time and space. I'm God. I see you in heaven eternity when I have completely transformed you, healed you, and made you the best version that I intended of you. And I'm giving you credit for that. And I'm smiling on you right now saying, son, can you see yourself like that? Because if you do, you'll start letting go of those little crutches, those little vices, those little image enhancing things that you try to do to feel cool around that group. You know, your shortcuts to satisfaction and happiness. None of it's going to work, but accept what Jesus has done. You live with full rights as a, as a, uh, as a son of the father, and you don't have to chase all this junk. That's what refathering, that's what identity versus image is all about. That's why Jesus is the only way and the total way. And once you get that, then you have a blueprint for how to live. It's Jesus. And you read the Bible, listening to Abba Father speaking to son Jim, or son Jeff, or whoever the guy is out there, um, God's son, waiting to hear, what's he going to say to me today? In a sermon, in a podcast, you know, in the Bible, in a quiet time. Man, my journal and the things God's saying to me, Jim, in the last three years has just exploded. It's full. I don't, I don't, I don't write girly long prose. I write bullet points, coaching points, uh, rephrased Bible verses, um, Things that are like, wow, God just said that to me in man man language. I draw mm. pictures sometimes of what God's showing me. You know, it's really interesting, Jeff. You've mentioned a couple times friendships and and relationships. And you know, our mutual friend Patrick Morley wrote a book, and in that book he said, one out of twelve guys in the church are not connected to other men. We have a real problem with men not connecting relationally with other men. And you you gave a whole section of your book to this thing called friendships. You called it a uh, huddle, I think, uh, which is, can you talk to us in the last 15 minutes of our show? Why? why I mean, I, I, you know, it seems to me like my default, my identity is in Christ, but my default is to brand or to image. So I have to have a group of people around me to default me and keep me in my sweet spot, which is my image surrounding Jesus and not my image surrounding brand. Can you talk to us about how vital it is for men to form vibrant and dynamic relationships with high-level guys? Yeah. Um, okay, so the book has four sections like you're referring. The first is receive, you know, your A, your identity, and B, your minute-to-minute -minute marching orders like Jesus did. 
Second is transform. Keep changing. Keep growing. Keep adjusting. You know, from proud to humble, from stingy to generous. Uh, you know, from consumer in relationships to an investor. Like you be the one that forgives first, instead of the one who's always it. Okay, so that's the that's the second section. Transform. The the third section is huddle. It's really about friendship. It's brotherhood. It's teamwork. Um, I don't just tell men, oh, have some quality relationships. I think man language is have a brother in your life. Have a dude that's got your back and be a guy that has his back. I call that level five friendship. And I took the idea from um, the business book by Jim Collins. You got it right there. Good to great. Um, and I'll get to explaining it in a second. But the fourth section is lift which is the, the kind of the what you do as a man. You lift others. Jesus always lifted others, dignified people, lifted his team, you know, made sent them out two by two. They changed the world. He was lifting them, empowering them. He even helped them feed 5,000 people. He didn't do it himself. He, he said, you guys go feed them. Jesus was lifting. So that, that's the kind of boss, dad, coach he would be. But let's not get lost there. Let's go back to huddle. Level five friendship is basically huddling on a consistent basin basis with one, two, maybe three at the most of your closest friends so that you can process your life together and get the benefit of teamwork, other perspectives. And Jim, you mentioned a few statistics. Morley talked about, you know, how few guys have friends. 76% of men um, have no one in their life that they can talk to about anything of significance. What? Seventy. I've never heard that before, but I believe it. It makes sense to me. This is in the 2021 American Survey of Perspectives. Wow. Uh, there's also a statistic that I think just under 63 uh, percent of American men do not have a best friend. And some of the guys in this listening audience will say, "Yeah, well, my wife is my best friend." And I'm saying, "Dude, no, no way. No way. <laughs> she." can't be your best friend that makes you a better husband. You need a best friend that speaks some truth to you, kicks you in the butt, or loves you when yeah. she kicked you in the butt and says, dude, you're not a, you're not a hey, she well, said, hey, we'll send him, we'll, we'll send him to Clarence Shuler. or he'll straighten him out. Right. Okay. <laughs> so um there's an epidemic of loneliness and isolation, and it's probably worse for presidents of the United States, presidents of companies, and major successes who live up on some pedestal, like a pastor or something. Leaders, Howard Hendricks found that out of 500, 250 leaders that had a falling in their late in life, kind of crisis, you know, hypocrisy thing, a scandal, uh, only five of them, six of them, only six of them had a deep quality friend. The rest were disconnected. 244 of them were disconnected from true friendship. Now, here's why. 90% of people think they're self-aware, meaning they see their own stuff and they don't think it smells or they know how much it smells. They know they got some problems. They're, they think they're self-aware. The reality is 10% of people, psychologists say, are actually self-aware. And the way to be self-aware is to say, I'm not self-aware. I want to be self-aware. I'm going to ask other people, what's it like to live with me? And what am I like? And then I'm going to have friends who I process stuff with. And if I say something really stupid, it's going to sound stupid coming out of my, my mouth usually. Or if it's not that sound, like when I was meeting with my level five friend, Greg, one day, and I said, hey, Greg, I want to say this to my son. He's grown and we got this issue. I'm kind of concerned about this. And Greg goes, oh, okay. Do you think you got a lot of credibility on that issue with him? And I said, not really. And he said, can I ask another question? I said, sure. Do you think it'll turn out well if you talk to him about that? And I said, no. He said, oh, okay, you might want to rethink that. My friendship at level five, meeting with Greg every week, we've agreed on confidentiality. Uh, we, I know he's safe to talk to. Um, I'm going to be there every week and connect with him. I'm going to be self-disclosing. Uh, I'm not going to wait for him to say, oh, Jeff, did you look at porn this week? Uh, did you cheat on your taxes? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to put that stuff out on the table proactively. I put my little fathering idea of a grown son in front of my friend, and he asked me a simple question, and I self-answered, and I became more self-aware by being real in front of my safe, trusted, loyal friend. 
Most men don't shake hands on confidentiality. They don't shake hands on, hey, will you be safe? And and can I be safe with you? Um, I, I want to go deep with you. Do you? If the guy doesn't agree to that, fine. Stay nice and friendly, but go find a different level five friend to huddle with every week. And even if you're not live, like I was over lunch with Greg, Zoom with a guy every week. I Zoom with guys every week and we go all the way deep right away, like within five minutes after telling a joke or did you see Josh Allen, you know, play that crazy, amazing game. Um, we're going to ask this question. What's the most important thing going on in your life that you want to talk about? What's the most important thing that you need to talk about? And then we ask a second question. What's the most important thing I can pray for? This is the pattern, Jim, I've used um, with Greg and Pete for 10 years now. Um, I have a group of, and I, I don't like using the word group because this isn't small groups. This isn't competing with Bible studies. Uh, um, small groups are great. Accountability groups are great. Bible studies are great. But you cannot be best friends with five, six, seven guys. There's someone in there you'll have a little doubt about that will stop you from telling them that you, you and your wife haven't slept together for two months or that alcohol is kicking your butt or whatever it is, right? But with your one or two best friends, when he, when, when he asks you what's the most important thing you need to talk about and you know he's safe and committed, you can drop your guard, put it on the table, and then you can do this. And I'm going to show a picture right now. You could do something that the Bible says sets you free from the trap of selfishness and shortcuts and stupid stuff. It's called sin. James 5.16 says, confess your sins one to another and you will be healed, set free. And here's the picture. I know the guys... Um, that are looking on YouTube can see it and the other guys can't, so I'll explain it. Let's say you confess a sin to God, this vertical line. You're forgiven 100%. He forgives you. Jesus accomplished it. It's done. But we might keep doing that sin, especially if it's porn or something that creates shame. Then you get secret, then it gets worse. But if you confess your sin horizontally to Pete and Greg over lunch or on a Zoom or on a phone call, look at the circumference, the strength, that is added to the power to not do that thing again. Because you're accountable, you're known, you're visible, they're there to pray for you. You know, it's it's incredible. I told Pete one day, um, after I'd been on a men's retreat, and I'd been to speaker gym like you have been many times, and uh, I came back to my hotel two nights in a row, and this couple, the first night was having sex, and I heard it, and it was loud, and I was like auditorially, you know, transported into this auditory porn. It wasn't my fault. I shouldn't beat myself up. No fault in, in my part. You know, I said, I hope they're married. Um, and, and then I didn't put on my headphones. I didn't turn on ESPN. I didn't call my wife. I didn't text Pete and Greg. I listened. I imagined it. And then the next night, I even slowed down next to their room to say, hey, are they at it again? I knew based on that not being the Jeff I want to be loyal to God and loyal to Stacy, and it wasn't good for me. Um, any comparison or you know imagination in the sex area, anything other than your bride, you know, as a gift from God, it's going to screw you up, dude. Why sex before marriage messes you up for the rest of your life. You can quit it and confess it, but without friends, you will not stay away from it again. Anyway, I told Pete on Monday, um, and I told myself I'd better tell him this. And before I even have a taco chip, I better tell him because I got to get it out. I, I don't want to. He's going to think I'm less of me. He's going to think I'm a schmuck. Guess what? I told Pete, and he immediately leaned in, smiled at me, and said, dude, that's what I like and respect about you is that you're that honest with me. And then, and I felt so much more, you know, safe and respected than I expected to be. And also, I felt great that I confessed it to him. I knew God forgave me, but I wanted to be free of it the next time. Pete then says, man... And there's something that I've been uh, kind of struggling with and haven't dealt with uh, for at least three weeks. And I, I want to apologize and confess to you. All of a sudden, we were both so much stronger, Jim, than we were before we opened up and self-disclosed. And all of a sudden, we were free. And the grip of that sin and that behavior was not as strong anymore. This is why every dude listening needs a best friend, and I'd say two. Because two personalities and a trio meeting together is more powerful than one.
you can read Ecclesiastes about a triple braided cord uh, and you figure out part of that. But we men, we need our best friendships. And it's a verb. It's not a group noun. You can join a group and you can unjoin a group, but you don't join an unjoin friendship. You build it and it sustains and it makes life very joyful, very honest, very self-aware and very transforming. You keep growing and becoming a better version of yourself in teamwork through level five friendship. Um, I'm going to show the picture real quick. The, the lowest levels of friendship, man, that's your network. You don't even remember their name. You met them, but you found them. But you bring, yeah, and you get to the middle, and those are the guys you see at work or, you know, uh, at, the, at the, you know, basketball league or something. Um, but level four starts to get really thick and deep. That's a 2 a.m. friend. You'll call him when things are down, when the chips are down, when there's a crisis. And you'll be honest, and you, he knows your secrets, and you know his, but not all of them. And you've never defined confidentiality and trust. And you're not even in touch with him for three months. So how can he help you next month when your marriage is struggling? Level five, look how deep it is. You can't have as many of those as you can level three or four. Yeah, it's narrower too. Narrower and deeper. These are the words. Can you read those words, Jim? To Trusted, our loyal, guys? confidential, intentional, committed, consistent, self-disclose, no secrets, confess, pray, transforming. And I coach men on how to do that because it's the way Jesus lived as a friend. He said, I call you guys my friends because I show you everything that my father showed me. And I want you to be friends to each other and be honest. Stephen, go ahead. You doubt? That's cool. I can handle it. Put your fingers in my hand and my side. Peter, you denied me three times at my crucial moment and you were my main dude. Uh, I know you must feel like crap. Well, dude, I got a fire here on the beach. And I gave you a little business advice and said, throw the net on the other side. You caught 153 fish, but why don't you sit down here and I'm going to ask you three times a question. Do you love me? And then three times I'm going to bless your socks off and I'm going to affirm you and I'm going to call you out and I'm going to name you. And I'm going to say, you are a good man. Feed my sheep, tend my lambs, spread the gospel, take care of the church. You're my leader, Peter. That's friendship. And Jesus wants that for us. And he empowers us for us, for it. And only if you know what he did for you and what the father thinks of you, will you have the guts to tell your friend, you yep. looked at this stupid website, not looked at it once, but it's your go-to yep. or this alcohol or this or that, right? No, that's good, man. So, hey, hey, before I get you off the call, Jeff, I want to invite our guys into what we call every week, our boots on the ground. So guys, what is the next step for you? What action will you take because of what you heard today from Jeff? So guys, here's what I want you to think about today. What brand are you selling about yourself that is not wrapped up in your identity with Jesus? I want you to think about that and come up with an answer. What brand are you selling? And then use that as a springboard to lock arms and share that with some other guys. So Jeff, thanks so much for coming on the podcast. How do our guys get a hold of your, what's, give us the book title, full title again. It's right behind your shoulder there, yeah. but full title and how our guys can get a hold of your resources. Well, I'm kind of into coaching. So thanks for teeing it up. I'll, I'll encourage the guys. Let me first pray for them. God, uh, whatever you're saying to each of these guys, help them depend upon you to act upon it. And they got to talk to some other guy about it. They got to process it with someone. Um, help them to ask for confidentiality and commitment from someone. And if they get that approval and shake hands, that they they'll go talk to them and open up. So uh, build that uh, commitment to process this uh, and guide them to whatever their next steps are to gain their identity as a son and to live like Jesus through His power uh, in teamwork of friendship in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hey, Jeff, so I guess thanks. I'd yep. say this, Jim. The book is um, Receive the Way of Jesus for Men. And it's got a bunch of diagrams in it, like I was showing you before. Um, and it has some QR codes at the back that'll give you some free resources. And one of them is on friendship. Right there is the Level 5 Friendship Playbook. It's only 10 pages. It's bullet points. You know, it's almost you can color it in with a crayon. It's made for us guys. <laughs> um, but it's free at my website, and you can share it with your couple buddies and say, 
how's this type of friendship sound? Let's let's decide if we want to do this and when we can start talking each week and processing. It'll get you over the hurdles, give you those couple key questions, describe the characteristics of it. Um, so that's my 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 biggie is I want to encourage guys to get the level five friendship playbook. It's free and you can share it around all you want. All right. Uh, and then secondly, uh, go pick up a copy of Receive the Way of Jesus for Men. It's at Amazon. Um, I'm selling them at my website. Um, not I'm selling it. To, I don't sell them at the website. We sell, sell them in bulk uh, through my publisher. If guys want to buy 12 or more to give to their you know group of friends or to their team or something like that. Um, but I'd like to offer a free three-month license to the audiobook. I recorded it in my personal raspy voice. Awesome. Uh, and I laugh at some of my own jokes, tell my own stories. Um, but I'd love for some of the guys who love to listen to to, to books, they can have it free um, as a license on my publisher's app. And I'm going to put that on my website. And I'd love to put it on your website too if they go to yours. Uh, but there's a QR code uh, that looks just like that. Guys can actually can, you know, take a picture of it right now. Um, actually, I'm going to come up with a new one. So I just tricked them. But I'll come up with one specific to these guys, three months license to the audio book, and you can get a taste and a flavor of it. So please get the free Level 5 Friendship Playbook at my website. It's menhuddle.com, menhuddle.com. It's the same site as my other one, Jeff Kemp Team, jeffkempteam.com. Uh, and they'll find all this information there for the playbook and also to pick up receive through the audiobook offer all right so menhuddle.com so thanks a lot jeff hey man sure appreciate our time together guys and want to encourage you to go back uh to one of our previous episodes with jeff so guys check out episode 314 we recorded a, a an episode about his first book so guys hey thanks for coming jeff sure appreciate you brother and uh keep fighting the fight thanks jim can't wait to do it again with you man Hey guys, as you know, our man laws are mostly supplied by you and they're found in my free online resource, Man Laws, 101 Ways to Get Your Man Card Revoked and Rules to Live By. This is man law number 38 out of 101. And here it is. Man law number 38 is this. When you are in a public urinal and there is a man to the right and to the left, never turn your head, but look straight ahead of you. And if by some accident you happen to look to the right or the left never ever look down so the life rule there guys is this respect a man's personal space hey guys again we want to thank you for making this spotify's number one podcast for christian men last year our podcast subscribers tripled because you shared and subscribed this show with others. So thank you guys for doing that. If you haven't subscribed already, please do so. And please share this great resource with your bros. Until next time, feel the wet sand on the arena floor. Hear the deafening roar of the crowd. Taste the sweetness of victory. Smell the stench of battle. Get in the game. Get dirty. Grind it out. And be a man.